Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Amy Smith, a member of the volunteer team behind Labour Outlook and I'm also an activist with Venezuela Solidarity Campaign. Thanks so much for joining us today to discuss Che Guevara, the ideas behind the icon, an event organised by Labour Outlook. Labour Outlook is a fast growing website bringing you daily news and views from Labour's left and those at the forefront of resisting the Tories. And this event is kindly being hosted and streamed um, online by Arise Festival. This is actually the first in a series of in-depth forums that we're going to be having um, on socialist ideas um, and it's a new series. And it's also great to see hundreds of people joining this discussion today. So Che Guevara is one of the most iconic political figures of the 20th century and also one of the most important. His role in the leadership of the Cuban Revolution and resisting imperialism across the whole continent of Latin America made him not only a great revolutionary in practice, but his ideas and his example have inspired literally millions of people across the world. Those ideas are important because they help us to understand the process that is unfolding across Latin America and the Caribbean today. And our discussion comes at a time of a renewed wave of rebellion against neoliberalism across that continent. We've seen new left gov governments being elected in Mexico, Bolivia, Colombia and Chile. And they join others, including Cuba and Venezuela, in a bloc dedicated to imposing, opposing imperialism and putting people on planet before the profits of US multinationals and the Latin American elites. Hopefully Brazil, led by Lula, will also join them at the end of this month. So one aim of the discussion today is to shed some light on the revolutionary ideas of Che Guevara that have inspired so many people in Latin America, the Caribbean, and indeed around the whole world. And to help us get behind the iconic post imagery to the important ideas underneath, we're joined today by two excellent speakers. Firstly, Bernard Reagan, who is the National Secretary of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign, and also Matt Wilgress, who's a longtime campaigner for Latin American Solidarity, and he's a member of the editorial team behind Labour Outlook. And we also want to take as many questions as possible from our audience today. Um, so because of the size of the audience, um, I believe we've had um, hundreds of people register in advance. We do have volunteers who are going to be facilitating the questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. So please post any comments and questions that you have for the speakers in that Q&A function. And we will have time for a few rounds of questions from the audience after the speakers. And please also let us know where you're joining from today by posting in the Q&A as well. Um, and one final thing before we, we get over to our first speaker, please do make a donation if you can, so that Labour Outlook can increase its web presence and put on more excellent events like tonight. So now I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Bernard Reagan, who is the National Secretary of the Cuba Solidarity Campaign. Bernard. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you to Labour Outlook uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And just to follow up, uh, in terms of talking about Che as an icon, uh, you saw on screen at the beginning uh, the classic picture which everybody immediately recognises as being the picture of Che Guevara. I think in some ways it's it's important and kind of valuable that we can see that image and that recollection, which is universally recognized very quickly. But it's slightly ironic that it's a picture that <coughs> singles out Q uh, Che that uh, presents him as a sort of individual uh, disassociated from any kind of other presence. And the irony is that that picture was actually taken on a very, very large demonstration that was taking place in Havana in 1960 after the blowing up of the French vessel La Coubre, which was bringing arms from Belgium to the newly born Cuban revolution. And it was a demonstration that was taking place and Che was on that demonstration. In fact, having literally the day before tended to the wounded and dying who were injured by that explosion. It's uh, slightly ironic if I think that the picture has become kind of so unique and yet it's actually is taken out of context in terms of um, what actually was uh, the, the situation. Um, just to say something about um, Che's own background. I mean, he came, he was born in Argentina in 1929. He came from a fairly middle-class kind of family, but a family in which politics was present. So for example, his father was 
organized a uh, small group in the town where they were living at the time in solidarity with the uh, Spanish Republican uh, forces in the during the course of the of the Civil War. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was a household in which politics was discussed. It was also, uh, and this was kind of part of Jay's life throughout, those of you who have read uh, of him and have, have looked at his history, who he suffered from asthma. Uh, but as a consequence, he spent a lot of time reading. Uh, and also he records in one of his diaries that he actually learned French during this period from his mother, uh, who was very keen that he should do. And, and so as a consequence of that, he was quite widely read uh, as, as a young man. Uh, and, uh, you know, that influenced his thinking later in life. I think it's also important to think about the context of Che, because I've mentioned the Spanish Civil War, 36, 39. Obviously, there was then the Second World War uh, and the rise of fascism and so on. And then the post-war period, uh, when clearly from 1945 onwards, the, uh, there was the introduction and the expansion of the Cold War between the United States and the USSR, uh, when the whole theme of anti-communism became a very virulent uh, throughout uh, and was kind of very markedly present politically uh, across the globe. Uh, so that's just very something very brief about the background of Che. But in addition to that, I think it's important just to register in the context of Latin America, the, if you like, the environment of the political environment of Latin America, first of all, from the United States perspective. Uh, and this is one which is still alive today. In 2017, I think it was, Donald Trump made a speech at the United Nations General Assembly in which he reasserted the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine, which was adopted by the uh, USA in uh, 1823, st essentially stated that countries in the Western Hemisphere uh, were in under the uh, rubric, under the control, if you like, the dominance of the USA itself, uh, and that no one else should interfere. And what it was saying was not so much that uh, European imperialism had no right to continue to try to dominate the, uh, the countries as they did for much of the, um, you know, the, certainly the 19th century, uh, but that in fact the USA had the right to have a say in what happened in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and that was kind of very much present uh, during this whole period of, uh, of the uh, time of uh, coinciding with, with Jay's life as the way in which they operated. In addition to that, um, in 1947, the USA established the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, which everybody here will recognize is a force that has been malignant and has been present uh, in the politics intervening in the presence of many countries over the years. Uh, in Latin America alone, for example, the United States was involved in, um, on 17 occasions, intervening in 14 countries. And of course, we still today see that happening. As Amy mentioned, the elections taking place in Brazil uh, and events that are taking place in Venezuela and so on. We see that the USA still seeks to interfere and the CIA very much part of that. An organization was established, as I said, in 1947, with this remit, a secret remit, which was given, a remit for propaganda, economic warfare, preventative direct action, sabotage and counter-sabotage, demolition and evacuation measures, subversion against hostile states, including assistance to underground resistance movements, guerrillas and refugee liberation groups. In other words, they had a complete license to operate wherever they wished in Latin America. And that's what they were doing uh, at the time when Che began his tours, his visits, his travels that he began in the late 1940s, early 50s as a student. And I think that whole experience of traveling across Latin America was something that uh, was very, very uh, formative in terms of his thinking and his, his ideas. Uh, and in particular, I mean, obviously he's witnessed the poverty uh, and, and the uh, problems that people faced in, across, the, across the continent. Uh, but he also, when he got to Guatemala, had a very direct 
political experience of, of uh, the role of the United States in Latin America, uh, one which I think was probably defining in terms of how Che subsequently became involved in the Cuban Revolution and the activities that he engaged in there and his thinking as it evolved in the subsequent years. In uh, 1951, uh, um, Jacobo Abenz was elected as the president and took office in 1951 with 60% of the vote, overwhelmingly more than three times any of his nearest rivals. Uh, he introduced a quite uh, modest uh, economic program, which was based on the need to try to establish independence for the country so that the resources of the country should be under the control of the country, that the land should be redistributed uh, equitably at the time, 70% uh, of the land was owned by a mere 2% of the population. And those were the sort of uh, steps that he wanted to take. In the country, the dominant, um, uh, if you like, economic force was the United Fruit Company from the United States of America, whose lawyer was one John Foster Dulles that some of you will have heard of, who subsequently became the Secretary of State to President Eisenhower. And it was really the interests of the United Fruit Company that influenced what happened subsequently because they lobbied the United States to intervene against Sal Benz to prevent him carrying out the land reforms that he suggested. The Americans went to Al Benz and told him that if he took the action that he did, that he was going to face a challenge from them. They would uh, carry out a bombing campaign. They would reduce Guatemala to ruins, they said. Uh, they would actually... Um, make steps to involve uh, any uh, attack that was perceived to be against neighboring Nicaragua and Honduras, who at this time were in the US's pockets, and that, that would, could cause for the United States to uh, launch uh, an all-out attack. Essentially, as a result of this, uh, and under pressure, Arbenz resigned. The sort of pressure that the US exercised uh, was that, for example, they carried out a bombing raid against one of the villages, which was where the largest United Fruit Company uh, holding was and where the majority of workers were, they were on strike. They bombed uh, and killed uh, many of the strikers. They took the leaders of that strike and literally threw hand grenades at their chest, uh, killing them as a result. Uh, and uh, Arbenz resigned and, and left office uh, because of that. Che's evaluation of that, which was recorded in his diaries, was that this was clearly, uh, you know, a tragic event that had occurred, but he thought that, you know, that this was not the way in which they should, people should respond when they were trying to defend uh, their sovereignty and their national interests. Um, what, uh, what he said was that the Guatemalan government, although it protested to Honduras, it let the planes enter without putting up any resistance and respect and, and presented the case before the United Nations. So it went to the UN to try and get help. We could quote lots of instances where countries have sought help from the United Nations. And in actual fact, of course, they got no kind of response, uh, no help at all. Che's, response, Che's comments about Arbenz's response is that he should have done more to resist. He should have armed the people and had confidence in the people to resist uh, and that they should have uh, put up a fight in the way in which at the time, to use his words, uh, Korea and Indochina were, Indochina being Vietnam, of course. So he's already drawing parallels between the struggles in Latin America and those elsewhere in the world uh, against imperialism. And that was very much kind of a theme which continued throughout his uh, life. It was also a theme that particularly this issue of uh, political sovereignty and economic dependence were interlinked and it was not possible to achieve one without the other, that political independence required economic independence and vice versa. And that I think was in, in a sense, something that was reflected in his response to uh, meeting uh, Fidel Castro and other uh, fighters who had carried out the, the attack on the Moncada barracks in 1953 uh, against the uh, dictator uh, Batista. Uh, and uh, they carried out unsuccessfully that attack. But on leaving and, and uh, going into exile into Mexico, they declared 
a very firm intention that that was what they would be continuing to do. This experience of the attack in Guatemala was, of course, something that after the, the successful revolution was carried out and the revolutionary government took office from the 1st of January 1959, that the United States uh, continued to wage an attack on Cuba in the way in which it waged an attack on Guatemala. So, you know, we could list all of the examples, many, many instances, bombing of, of uh, Havana in, in June, July of 1959, uh, the um, attack on sugar, sugar cane fields, burning them down, attacking the sugar mills. Uh, the Espania sugar mill was one of the attacks, but most notably, of course, the attack at Playa Giron, uh, the Bay of Pigs, in 1960, 61, when uh, they launched an attack with thousands of um, anti-revolutionary Cubans uh, and sponsored that. And the United States was directly involved in that. It trained them, it prepared them, it gave them the arms uh, to carry out that fight. But as Che recorded rather uh, cynically, perhaps, uh, you know, they hardly fired a shot once they were in encountered the... Um, uh, the rebel army, the revolutionary army, uh, which actually challenged them uh, and prevented that happening. But it was clearly the case that this was, in a sense, very much an echo of what he'd witnessed in Guatemala with the political sovereignty of Cuba under challenge uh, because of its attempt to seek economic independence. And when uh, the government in Cuba took steps to change the economy, to bring it under public control and public ownership, uh, they sought to do that with the uh, major areas. The first step that they took was land distribution, in a sense, very much like our bents of redistribution, in order that the, the land hunger, as he often talked about it, uh, was something that was satisfied and, and was present. In some ways, and it's interesting here, don't have time to develop it, but Che makes a point about the, the peasants in Cuba being, in a sense, brought to the revolution before workers were engaged in, in a major way. He doesn't say that it was a separation or that one lagged behind the other, but just sequentially, it was the peasantry who responded uh, to, the, to the struggle that they were waging. In terms of the, uh, uh, that uh, whole experience, one of the things that Che began to address after the revolution was that of the development of the economy. And here, uh, the first starting point I would make is that, and this is a thing which recurs in other elements of his thinking and is present there, is the major step stress on the question of the involvement of the masses, that people should be involved in the economic transformations that took place. They should be engaged in discussing the plans, that they should be engaged in the whole press of thinking through what were the changes that were needed to be brought about, uh, and that that should be something which was an active process, not something where a government kind of, if you like, somehow from above handed down prescriptions as to what should happen next, but something that actually should be uh, discussed, talked about, thought about, uh, and uh, carried out in a very thorough way. Uh, in, in, in similar ways to what has happened in recent months with the Cuban um, passing of the new family code, which is the a, a rad very radical statement that has introduced the concept of uh, same-sex marriages, for example, as one of the first countries or earliest countries, if not the first in Latin America to do so with very progressive measures in terms of the rights of women and children and uh, family obligations and so on and so forth. So that whole way in which Cuba operates and those things today, I would argue, is very much something that uh, you know, was there in Chase thinking and was present in the way in which they, they operated. That was true, uh, as I said, with regard to the econ economy. But it was more than that. It was that Che thought that you had to think through the whole process of the transition to socialism, what it meant, that the relationship of workers to work was different than it would be under capitalism, where workers are trying uh, to get the best uh, pay, if you like, individually within each factory, and that might vary with, in terms of the profitability of individual companies. Uh, and so some workers might be significantly better off than others. 
but rather to look at how you develop a more equitable society in which the collective or the wealth of the surplus that is produced is viewed as a collective gain. And therefore, that should be something that is distributed uh, throughout society and actually something that is beneficial to all of society. Um, he said, for example, that the pipe dream that socialism can be achieved with the help of the dull instruments left to us by capitalism. The commodity as the economic cell, profitability, individual material interest as a lever can lead into a blind alley. So he wanted to, to think about what this new relationship of workers to work would be. The, the state, for example, was not a boss state, as he described it, in which workers were in confrontation, but was a relationship of the people that was looking at how collectively plans could be developed in order that the interests of the whole of society could be met. And by the way, as an aside, he said that didn't mean losing the quality of production or thinking about personal needs in respect to production, but it did mean thinking critically about how to plan, how to develop, how to go forward in this collective kind of way. In addition to that, um, I just wanted to say that in respect of this relationship to, to the masses, he also regarded it as a very active relationship. So for example, one of the things that he was very uh, positive about in terms of talks that he gave with groups of workers, and some of which were on the television, was uh, one of uh, calling for anti-bureaucratism, of ensuring that there was not this gulf between the administrators and the workers, and that there was not this differential developing in which there was no engagement and no appreciation by the administrators of the tasks that workers faced and the role that they faced. And that was one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why he was enthusiastic about the concept of voluntary work, of people actually contributing above and beyond their regular work, if you like, to actually help develop, particularly in a society like Cuba, which the economy, where the economy was very much developing and, of course, was distorted by the impact of imperialism in terms of its development, its kind of you know, overwhelming uh, concentration uh, on the production of sugar uh, and uh, needing to think about how through a process of industrialization and process of development of planning, you could actually broaden out the base of the economy to give it a greater deal of strength. How am I doing for time, Amy? No, okay, she can't hear me. Sorry, Brian, you've got about five minutes left. That's fine, thank you. The other thing I want to say about this concept of the masses that, that Che refers to, I think it's very important because this, just coming back to the iconic picture we were talking about at the beginning, um, you know, Che is very much seen as, and the picture is actually called the heroic gorilla. And Che is very much seen in terms of combat, in terms of his, his role in the Cuban revolution, his uh, intervention in the Congo, his subsequent move to Bolivia and his death, his murder, uh, in Bolivia. But the concept of the masses was not, as I, this is what I've been trying to say about the economy, it was not something kind of abstract, it was extremely concrete of engagement. And he said this also about the question of guerrilla warfare. He said, uh, we repeat, the reject, we reject the implication for guerrilla warfare is a people's warfare. And an attempt to carry out this time of war without the population support is a prelude to inevitable disaster. So this question of even the conduct of the struggle was a consequence of the particular social and economic and political characteristics of Cuba, but was not something which was separated out from the masses or separate without engagement with the working class in particular. This is one of the things that some sections of the left are kind of criticizing for. But on the contrary, when the grandma the boat that carried the re revolutionaries from Mexico to Cuba landed. Uh, uh, it was actually designed to land to coincide with a general strike that was coordinated in Santiago by Frank Pice. Unfortunately, because of the weather, the boat didn't arrive and the two events didn't coincide. But there was a relationship with the working class. One of the most interesting things, one cases, is the battle at Santa Clara, which many people regard as the defining moment 
of the revolution when the uh, Batista uh, dictators forces were, uh, you know, were uh, defeated significantly. And that was that during that, uh, that battle, um, he liaised with the people inside the town, inside the city, and they contributed in all sorts of ways to facilitating the actions of the rebel army in defeating uh, Batista's forces. But over and above that, workers in Havana were preparing an armoured train to bring arms and reserves to support the uh, Batista government. They got in contact with Che and said, look, we're doing this. We don't want to do it. Do you want us to sabotage it? Do you want us to wreck it? What do you want us to do? And Che said, no, just keep us informed how progress is going on with this. Let us know when it's going to come out and then we'll know when it's going to act. So there was this kind of liaisons taking place between sections of the working class and the rebel army. And of course, uh, the peasants who were in the forefront of the revolution. So I think this question of the role of the masses and the relationship of Che uh, more widely I think is something which is sometimes left out of the equation because the image is there, uh, the tragic circumstance of his death is there, and uh, the role that he played in conducting the armed struggle, which was extremely important. But his contribution, I think, to the development of socialist ideas, particularly, I think, to look at the whole question of the transition to socialism, what's involved in that, what does that process mean? What are the implications and how should people respond? I think is important. There are other things I could talk to, but I think, Amy, I should probably stop at that point and, and thank you. Thanks, Bernard. That was, that was fascinating. Really, really interesting. And I personally learned quite a lot during that. So thank you. And we'll come to Bernard um, for questions after our next speaker. Um, I'm really pleased to say we've got nearly 200 people joined us now across a few different platforms and they're joining us from all over the UK and around the world. People from Northampton, Gwyneth, Brighton, Manchester, uh, where I am, Northamptonshire, Mexico, Peckham, Sheffield, Shropshire, Marla, Tyneside, Leeds and Beckenham and also from Indonesia, Norway and the USA. So welcome to everyone wherever you, you are joining us from tonight. Um, and as a reminder, if you've got questions um, for Bernard, um, if anything he's just said sparked a curiosity in you, please put those in the Q&A and also any questions for our next speaker. But I'll now introduce, it's Matt Wilgress of Liberal Outlook. Um, over to you, Matt. Thank you, Bernard, and thank you, Amy, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I just, some of what I was going to cover, Bernard has covered much more expertly than I would, so I'll keep my remarks quite brief, but I'm going to start with quite a long quote. Um, what is behind the Yankees' hatred of the Cuban Revolution? What is it that rationally explains the conspiracy which unites for the same aggressive purpose, the most powerful imperialist power in the world and the oligarchies of the entire continent, which together are supposed to represent a population of 350 million humans against a small country of only 7 million, economically underdeveloped, without financial or military means to threaten the security or economy of any other country? What unites them and stirs them up in fear? What explains this fear? Not fear of the Cuban revolution, but fear of the Latin American revolution. Not just fear of the workers, peasants, intellectual students and progressive sectors of the middle strata, which by revolutionary means have taken power in Cuba, but fear that the workers, peasants, students, intellectuals and progressive sections of middle strata will by revolutionary means take power in the oppressed and hungry countries exploited by the Yankee monopolies and reactionary oligarchies of America. That is a long extract from the second declaration of Havana, um, which we saw the 60th anniversary of this year. And in many ways, I think it's a document of the early years of the Cuban revolution in Che Guevara's time. And a document that still says so much, not just about the struggle against US domination by the people of Cuba, and indeed, indirectly the heroism of others in the years that followed, including those Cuban volunteers who defeated apartheid, South Africa and Angola, but also by waves and waves of rebellion have taken place in Latin America and the Caribbean against US domination. And why therefore this discussion on the ideas of Che Guevara not only live on, but it's still so relevant in many ways. I think it's this example of change that US imperialism, the ruling of oligarchies in Latin America have feared so much since the Cuban revolution, but also that has inspired so many heroic struggles, including ones taking place today, as our excellent chair pointed out in her introduction. In terms of Che Guevara, I think one of the key lessons we can take from Che that's relevant today is that you can't be a socialist without internationalism 
and without anti-imperialism. And in his famous call for one, two, three, many Vietnams, Che put a perspective for global resistance that remains pertinent to many today. I was reading this message today to the 1966 Tri-Continental Conference, which is a meeting of anti-colonial nations to advance the struggle against imperialism in Latin America, but also Africa and Asia then. And as well as this poignant and powerful salute to the people of Vietnam for their amazing struggle against the US, he says on imperialism, we must bear in mind that imperialism is a world system, the last stage of capitalism, and it must be defeated in a world confrontation. The strategic end of this struggle should be the destruction of imperialism. Our share, the responsibility to exploit and undevelop the world is to eliminate the foundations of imperialism. Our oppressed nations from where they extract capital, raw materials, technicians and cheap labor, and to which they export new capital, instruments of domination, arms and all kinds of articles, thus submerging us in an absolute dependence. In it, he also argues that Latin America is a forgotten continent in the last liberation struggles was now beginning to make itself heard. How relevant both those paragraphs sound again today. Um, and I think that's something that perhaps we can look at more in the questions about imperialism and internationalism as an opposition to imperialism. Um, in terms of the other topic Amy mentioned about heroic struggles over many decades in Latin America that have been inspired by Che, there are many examples one could cite from the time of Morris Bishop in Grenada through to the amazing struggles we see in Bolivia, where, of course, Che tragically died, but it's so respected today. Um, but I want to quickly focus on just one example, and that is how the internationalist messages of Che can be seen in the words of action of Hugo Chavez, whose election in Venezuela nearly 25 years ago sparked the first so-called pink tide and led to a new and still continuing discussion on the international left on socialism in the 21st century. As his presidency developed, learning from Che and documents such as the Havana Declaration, Chavez undertook to make the changes needed to genuinely make Venezuela independent of the US empire. And that meant above all taking control of natural resources and oil, ensuring the process of change was led by the mass of people, as illustrated by the way the people defeated the US back in 2002, and the people were freed from illiteracy in order to enable them to drive this change. Of course, this particular policy very much implemented with Cuban assistance and cooperation. But Chavez also publicly took on a very important theme from Che's about things and the aforementioned Second Declaration. Namely, that to progress real change, to really break from the domination of empire and to really start building a new society, you can't outsource stages or elements of that struggle. The mass of the people themselves have to make that change themselves. And ultimately, this has to be an anti capitalist change. In Cuba, it was the nationalization in the 1960s, plantations, mines, mills, factories, and banks that opened up that real change taking real power from the oligarchs and business and dominating external interests. Che Guevara's role, as Bernard mentioned, in this change was central. And his writings on the economy and society still have much to teach us today, including in terms of his writings on tackling bureaucratism and politically on the dangers of sectarianism and division amongst those forces working for a new and better world. To conclude, I think there is a central message in today's discussion as well that we can all learn from. It is that through struggle that change for the better has always been won and we're won. And it is through building international links and solidarity that we can amplify, reinforce and strengthen struggles all over the world. And it's through that we can win socialist change. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, so much more interesting ideas put forward there as well for us to reflect on. So do remember if you've got any questions um, for Matt or Bernard, um, or both, pop those in the Q&A. Um, so you can find that at the bottom of the screen um, and just put those in and our volunteers will um, send them over to me to, to read out. Um, so while they're coming in, we're going to briefly go over to our Labour Outlook volunteer, Ben Hayes, who's going to tell us a little bit more about Labour Outlook and also, I believe, a due to get into our pocket. Uh, ben. Hello, um, can you hear me? Can hear you, Ben, yeah. Okay, uh, come on, okay. There we go. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my name's Ben, I'm part of the volunteer team here with Labour Outlook. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the website, uh, we set up a few years ago now to provide positive news, views, analysis from a Labour left perspective. The last week alone, we've had uh, Ian Lavery on the Trusted Economic Agenda, 
analysis on the environmental policies pushed forward at Hearty Conference uh, with a report back from Richard Berg MP and Gemma Bolton from the NEC. Um, we've had a statement from the Brazil Solidarity Initiative on the uh, obviously elections that's taking place there. And uh, even for events like this, just to use a streaming platform uh, that does uh, kind of cost money. Um, so there'll be a link going through in the chat currently to uh, for where you can donate to Labour Outlook. I appreciate it's a, obviously a difficult period for a lot of people at the moment, but if you can contribute anything, it's very much appreciated. Uh, just also to uh, note a few events to put in your diary coming up. On December the 10th, uh, Arise, the organisation we are affiliated to, this publication, have got the national conference, first one in a few years, uh, to take place kind of in person as well as uh, online. Um, so that will bring together a range of MPs, trade unionists, campaigners. I can't think of a better way to kick off your uh, Christmas period. And then on January 23rd, I know we're already advertising events next year, uh, the form uh, will be taking place with the economist Michael Roberts looking at the relevance of Marx to the uh, current economic crisis and understanding it. Uh, on the 28th of January, we've got the annual Latin American conference, which anyone who's uh, been before, uh, it's a fantastic event and speakers from across the region, uh, always a great chance to, to get involved and, and learn more um, about kind of some exciting events going on in the world. Um, so make sure you note down all those. If you can donate, please, please do. That's very much appreciated. Uh, make sure to keep reading Labour Outlook and follow us on a various social media platforms and enjoy the rest of your event. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, and just so everyone watching, please do donate if you can. It is, it is really vital um, as a way for us to deliver these events for you. All the links, everything that, that Ben just mentioned should be coming up in the chat. So have a look at those if you've not done already. Um, now we're going to take some questions that have been put to us in the in the Q&A already. Um, please keep submitting your questions. Um, we've got you know around 20 minutes to take those now. Um, so I'm going to start with a question sent in by one of the viewers. Um, and I'm going to put it to Bernard first and then to Matt so they'll both get a chance to respond with it. Um, and the question is on um, economic ideas. It's to what extent are Chair's economic ideas as the Minister for Industries still adopted by the Cuban people? And also to what extent are they relevant more broadly around the world? Um, so I'll come to Bernard first on that and then I'll, I'll come to Matt. I, I didn't catch the beginning of it. I know it's about the economic ideas and their influence or potential relevance in other parts of the world. That was the gist of it. I'll repeat it for you, Bernard. So it's to what extent are Chair's economic ideas as Minister of Industries still adopted by the Cuban people? And then the second part is to what extent are they relevant more broadly around the world? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, in, in Cuba itself, there was uh, an attempt clearly to initiate in industrialization industrialization within the context of the dominant areas of the economy, which were predominantly agriculture, uh, and to try to develop that process and obviously to ensure that they could conduct trade. From the very beginning, they faced a blockade from the US, which cut sugar quotas, which meant that, uh, you know, from a large part of their exports, they were, they were denied any kind of income coming into the country. Uh, and it was a consequence of that, that they, um, began a relationship with the United, uh, with the USSR in terms of kind of trade. But one of the things that Che uh, was concerned about uh, was the monoculture of uh, the economy. That is its dependency on, particularly on sugar, tobacco to a lesser extent, but particularly on sugar. And that was an issue which he, uh, you know, constantly referred to as something that they should address. And that idea of the way in which the, uh, countries throughout the developing world are uh, have a, their capacity to develop economically constrained by the way in which uh, you, you know imperialist monopoly companies have uh, sought to impose kind of monocultural uh, production I, I think is is very relevant relevant as something that uh, should actually kind of obviously uh, be discussed and, and taken up in terms of uh, the future and certainly something they were trying to address within Cuba in terms of the development of the, of the Cuban economy. Um, I think those ideas remain relevant today. And one of the ways in which um, in recent uh, years, um, Cuba has been trying to address that has been the development of ALBA. Uh, that is an economic relationship that is initiated through Venezuela 
and Bolivia, uh, which is seeking to um, establish an ex a form of exchange in which countries um, pay mutual respect to the economic character of, their, of the countries that they're dealing with in developing a, a process of exchange, which, which is not an exploitative trade relationship between those countries. And ALBA, I think, is a potential it's still very small, relatively speaking, to the economies of those countries, but it includes within, I think, the embryo of an idea about what the kind of economic relationship should be, be between socialist countries in terms of kind of respect for, uh, you know, what countries produce, what their needs are, and how those can be mutually bet by that relationship. I think that, in a way, is a continuance of uh, the ideas that some of the ideas that were present, I think, in Jay's thinking. Thanks so much, Bernard. And Matt, would you like to come in on this? No, no, I think that's a, that's a great answer. Let's head on to the next one. Lovely, thanks. Um, so we've got um, three questions lined up next. Um, so I'll, I'll go slowly on them. The first two um, do relate to each other. So our first one is, um, was Che Guevara's view of socialism based on a democratic, cooperative and organizing vision or on an authoritarian system like Stalin's USSR? A lot of people make claims around about Che and repression, violence and so on, but others dispute these. Um, so that's the first question. And second one is, can you say something about Che's belief that a new man is needed for the transformation to socialism? Um, and finally, a question that um, Bernard might want to come in on specifically, and maybe we can start with this one. Um, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this last name, apologies. But Paolo um, Ferreri said that Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and Amikar Cabral were the pedagogues of the revolution as opposed to the revolutionary pedagogues. And what do you think of that? I'm happy to repeat those if we, if we need them at all. Um, but Bernard, I will come to you first. Okay, I mean, I think in terms of the issue of the kind of vision of socialism that Che had, I, I, I think I was trying to explain that, and my apologies if I didn't do that adequately, but it was about uh, the engagement of the masses in the whole process, that any activity which socialists take, which doesn't take cognizance of the needs and the uh, desires of the mass of people, which doesn't relate to them and engage with them, not in some patronizing way, but in some way of real uh, involvement and engagement, uh, will not succeed, quite simply. Uh, and he said that that was critical. And his speeches, if you read them through, I mean, they're, they're not, they don't have the kind of dramatic content that some of the quotations that Matt and I have given earlier have in terms of kind of, you know, being very definitive, but in terms of the method that he applied, his approach to discussing with workers, the way in which work should be developed and the economy should be developed, uh, I think were essentially that, they were democratic. They were about workers uh, gaining control of planning in order to ensure that the needs of people were met and that they were involved in that whole process. And that even went down to the factory level or the workplace level, where he was talking about people engaging in, you know, ensuring that there was a minimalization of waste in production, that people should look at ways in which they could reorganize the production to make it more efficient and to actually ensure that um, it was successful. And that kind of, it seems to me, is one of the critical things that a socialist society has to address is meeting the needs of the people and engaging the people in doing that. So, you know, I, I, I was trying to make the point, and perhaps I didn't do it adequately, but certainly that the concept of the masses in Che's thinking was an ever-present in whatever facet of political kind of uh, direction or issue he was addressing, that was something there. And it was certainly there in the sense of, you know, having a sense of cooperation in those processes. I mean, today in Cuba, there are many, quite literally, cooperatives operating in the area of agriculture, for example, but also recently with uh, new changes that have taken place in the economy. Uh, there are, um, you know, enterprises which are on a cooperative, cooperative basis, but on the political level about talking about cooperation, uh, what I was saying about the addressing issues of planning and, and uh, co combating bureaucracy, uh, that was very much, you know, very clear, I think, and very central to his thinking and the way in which he um, you know, 
saw it going forward. Uh, with regard to um, wh whether you know he um, could be described as a Stalinist, I think that's no, is, would be my answer. And I think that would be wrong. It would be wrong to look at it from the point of view of his methodology of, of operation. Uh, there was a complete contrast in the terms of the way in which he addressed issues to do with the bureaucracy uh, that uh, one could look at the uh, Soviet Union and look at the way in which uh, it, it evolved, the way in which uh, the bureaucracy became and the nomenclature, the privileged layers within the Soviet Union became an exclusive caste which uh, reserved to themselves all kinds of privileges which uh, couldn't remotely say were engaged with the mass of people uh, in, in the processes of production and planning in the Soviet Union. I think I would say that they were at complete odds uh, with that way of thinking. Um, uh, having said that, I go back to the point I made in the introduction that you have to see Che in context. And the context was the Cold War. The context was the actual assault by the United States of America, literally physical assault uh, that it was prepared to make to intervene uh, against uh, the Soviet Union and communism as it saw it. And for that reason, Cuba uh, was obliged and forced into a situation where it entered into an economic relationship with the, with the Soviet Union, but it very much kept its, its own thinking, its own uh, political perspective, even in the course of that. And that was one of the themes that Che came, came uh, to assert very much, and that was that they had a relationship of respect based on the basis of sovereignty of people, even where people had different economic systems or different political ways of organizing. But he said, we have no tolerance for, uh, uh, for the issue of the exploiters and the exploited. On that, you know, we stand firmly uh, on the side of the exploited and we won't accept that. Sorry, the other question was about Paulo Freire's comment. Uh, I, I think that's a really in interesting comment. I mean, Freire is still an influential figure in the development of education in Cuba, uh, and his methodology and his approach is, is, is something that is reflected on. And, you know, I've, I've been to many educational establishments in Cuba, and you can see that in the, in the relationships between teachers and pupils uh, and the approach that is adopted to the way in which the learning process goes on. And... Um, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've said this to people before. Uh, one of the words that you will hear said in Cuban schools is the word love. Um, and it's not a word that you will hear in any educational establishment in Britain when you're referring to the relationship between pupils and, and students. In other words, there was a real there is a real cherishing of the uh, will and the willing, uh, the aspirations and the desires of students uh, and their engagement. And um, I, I think uh, what was said is a very uh, fitting tribute actually to, to Che and Fidel and to the other revolutionaries. Hello, thanks Bernard. Um, Matt, would you like to come in on any of those questions? Yeah. I can repeat them if you need them. No, I thought that was, they were really interesting questions. I won't uh, talk about the last one and Bernard's certainly more of an educational expert than me. Um, on the other two, I think the ideas about a new man is socialist man stuff is something that I remember have read about but it's not something that I would feel I could comment on particularly but I think the con some of the concepts that drive behind that are quite interesting in terms of seeing work seeing a relationship with other individuals seeing things in a relationship with our community and our nation in a very different way to how we are sort of taught to see it or learn to see it under capitalism cultural change and I think that is quite interesting it's sort of against a sort of technocratic or bureaucratic vision of socialism. On the um, broader question on authoritarianism, which I think also links to some of the other questions um, from the person reading John Leander's biographies and others in the chat, um, I think it's quite an important one. I thought Bernard answered it very well. Um, someone sort of sarcastically emailed in, I think someone who wasn't particularly friendly to us having this event, um, saying, oh, would you um, support this new chant of uh, Ho Chi Minh Che Guevara Stalin, which is one group that started chanting on some demonstrations. And I, of course, I think that we need to take what Bernard said very seriously on these things because Guevara's writings and um, his actual practice is very different to that of um, Stalin. And it isn't helpful for people to be 
lumping them in together. Um, they can't go into it in great detail, but there's all the points Bernard made. There's also obviously the point about internationalism and the need to spread the um, concepts of progressive and socialist change beyond the borders of your own country and the need to, you know, the socialist countries to work together and to transition to internationally. That's obviously something he's very different views on. His concept of socialism, cooperation and the issues of bureaucratism and issues that Bernard raised. Um, and also, I think, like, how it carries on today in terms of how the left develops in Latin America. I think the great thing about Che's example is that internationalism and, and is the idea that you can make change and that you don't sort of outsource it to other forces in society or look at the change as a really slow, gradual stages that never seem to be completed, that that change needs to be sort of uninterrupted and anti-capitalist. So um, I agree with Bernard that Shea had a very different sort of vision of socialism and one that we can learn from today, along with other people, obviously, that we learn from and talk about in other forms, Marx, Rosa Luxemburg and many others. Excellent, thanks, Matt. And you, you've mentioned internationalism, and we've got a couple of questions on that topic. So I'll put those to, to the both of you now. The first one is from one of our viewers on Facebook. Um, so they've asked Cuba's internationalism in health and medicine is something that stretches back decades. Could the speakers say more about how Che Guevara influenced this as someone who had been active in the field of medicine and also give some examples um, for attendees who might be newer to following Cuban politics? And secondly, Cuba has sent significant numbers of health professionals to aid other economies. To what extent was the surplus of doctors and nurses that allows this a long-term plan of the revolution in Cuba? And that questions then from one of our viewers here on, on Zoom. Uh, so two questions on internationalism, particularly focused on the health and medicine aspect. Um, I'll come to Bernard first on those. Yeah, I mean, an interest, interesting fact is that when the revolution took place, there were 6,000 doctors on the island of Cuba and 3,000 of them left. So Cuba was in a very parlous phase. Most people, because the medicine was private, uh, most people had no access to, to medicine. So medicine along with education, health along with education, became one of the priorities of the, of the Cuban revolution. Today, for example, Cuba spends a higher GDP on education than any other country in the world, something like 13, 14%. Our spend expenditure in Britain is something like 5%. Similarly on health, they made that a priority. And those began very, from the get-go, uh, the issue of health and education uh, when the revolution was victorious were things that they addressed immediately. Indeed, even prior to that, the revolutionary and the rebel army, as it was moving from the east of the island towards Havana, actually in those areas that it conquered, it was actually establishing uh, primary healthcare uh, setups and, and educational uh, setups as well. So very much a part of that. Um, in terms of kind of whether it was a long-term plan, I think the long-term plan was health and education, but I think the, um, the expansion and, and uh, the visiting of health workers to other parts of the world it's really a consequence of the sentiments that Matt talked about in terms of Cuba's internationalism. And that is that you know, a, a victory against imperialism anywhere in the world is a victory for Cubans. And similarly, you know, the Cuban victory was a victory that was for everybody as well. And their sense of solidarity, again, something Matt alluded to in relation to sending forces to Angola, that was absolutely central to the defeat of apartheid in South Africa, and, and that's not a point I make. Nelson Mandela uh, visited Cuba, the first country he visited when he was released, and he paid tribute to the Cuban soldiers who had fought alongside um, the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO, uh, in, from Namibia, and forces from Angola in defeating the South African Defense Forces uh, at Tequito Carnavale which was an absolute landmark uh, event in terms of the history of Southern Africa. Indeed, one might argue the continent and wider, wider field. Um, and Mandela made reference to that. And one of the sayings that they have in Cuba, and this is where coming back to the relationship between that and, and, and health, is that the Cubans say solidarity is not giving what we have left over, it's sharing what we have. 
And I think they mean that. They mean that in a really sincere sense. And that's why they've sent doctors all over the world to deal with Ebola in West Africa. Uh, even during the COVID epidemic, they sent doctors to four continents across the globe, including to Italy, uh, where they operated in Turin and, and they were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize as a result of that. So health and education, what I'm saying is that they were organic to the concept of what the revo revolution was about, that an educated people is a liberated people. <laughs> and that therefore, in order to achieve that, you had to eradicate illiteracy, you had to begin to provide the material well-being that could support people. And that's something, uh, so the, uh, th if you like, the, the, the sending of doctors and medics abroad is part of that concept about what the Cuban revolution itself is about, but also about what they think and mean by uh, solidarity as well. Um, to the extent that it was Che's influence, it was Che's influence in the sense of those ideas, which are, if you like, organic to those developments, is something that uh, was present there in the actual revolution itself, the way in which they approached the revolution, how they looked at the needs of the people of Cuba and so on. Thanks so much, Bernard. Um, Matt, would you like to add anything? Just really quickly um, on the Angola matter that Bernard, I do, this is something that people, there's a wonderful film about this by someone called Isaac Zaney, which is quite hard to track down on the internet, but it's there if you look. Um, and he also wrote a thesis on it, which you can Google Isaac Zaney, Cuba, Angola comes up. Um, but I do think it's something that's really worth people researching, reading and looking into, like it was certainly something that really changed my politics in many ways when I first read about it. I think it is really worth digging deep into that and doing reading and watching on it. And um, the other thing I was just going to say was obviously that these Cuban internationalism in terms of in Latin America and the health internationalism is something that comes up a lot in the visions and struggles in Latin America. So for example, Bolsonaro, the far right president of Brazil, who hopefully will be a goner in a couple of weeks, um, got rid of Cuban health professionals when he first came in to power in Brazil and other countries after right wing coups have taken place, there's sort of been attacks on the Cuban health professionals in Bolivia and elsewhere. People have to be withdrawn for their safety. And um, the sort of more right wing, hard right wing opposition sectors in Venezuela have at times you know, attacked Cuban doctors and others. So it does show you that it's very much a live issue, but it can't be underestimated. It's something like the illiteracy program in, Cuba, in Venezuela, Chavez, um, that how much that's possible because of Cuban support. But it's also worth noting that Cuba also provides amazing support in situations where there isn't that kind of political friendship and support. People who remember the support Cuba gave to Italy early on in the COVID um, pandemic, the video that sort of went viral here. But also I remember the people um, being active around Pakistan, um, and it's probably getting to 15 years ago, the horrendous natural disasters in Pakistan where Cuba sent so many people to help rebuild and health and that. So that shows you just how genuine they are about that international. Brilliant, thanks so much, Matt. Um, so we've got just two questions left, but before I put those to our speakers, I'd just like to quickly tell you all about some events that are coming up. So our next big event is actually an in-person Arise Festival um, event. It's Arise Festival Conference in London. Um, and we're supporting them as a media partner. It's on Saturday the 10th of December and it's called Solidarity Struggle Socialism. There's going to be lots of excellent speakers there, um, John McDonnell, Richard Bergen, Nadia Whittam, also trade unionists um, such as Sarah Woolley from the Bakers Union and Mick Whelan from ASLEF, and also campaigns including Debt Justice, NHS Workers Say No, Stand Up to Racism and many more. And the conference is really a fantastic opportunity for a high level discussion on how we build um, this social, socialist internationalism that we've been discussing today. And you can find the full details of this, including the registration link in the chat. Um, we're also having the next forum in, in this Socialist Ideas series um, on Monday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. And that's um, on the, the economic crisis was marked right, and we'll be joined by economist Michael Roberts on that. So please do join us then. And in the meantime, sorry, that's me. Um, and in the meantime, make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and um, they're both at Labour Outlook. 
to keep up to date with what we're doing. And also just one more push on our donations. If you can donate, please do so to Labour Outlook and increase its web presence so that we can put on even more events like this. So now we're going to our final questions and I'll also ask the speakers if they could sum up as well in their answers. Um, so our first final question is, could you comment on how Cuba is developing diversity in its economy in the face of the USA blockade and the eroded economic relations with the former Soviet Union? And the final comment um, is simply um, from a comrade in North London, what writings of Che Guevara would the panelists recommend and why? Um, so Bernard, I'll come to you first. Sorry, Amy, I missed the last the last part of the question. No problem. Um, so the last question is, what writings of Che Guevara would you recommend and why? <laughs> um, on the economy. Um, Certainly, there has been an attempt to uh, diversify the economy. Um, Cuba has some natural resources in terms of metals and so on, um, but um, the uh, bulk of the economy is in the agricultural sector. There is a big challenge for the Cuban economy, and that is that a large proportion of its food is imported, much like Britain, something like 50% of it is imported. Um, it's tried to develop other uh, aspects of its economy, but as people will know, the big challenge that Cuba faces is the economic blockade imposed by the United States of America. And this is not just a blockade which affects relationships between Cuba and the United States. It, uh, for example, preventing farmers in the south of the US uh, from exporting their uh, products to Cuba, which is just 90 miles away, or in turn, Cuba uh, exporting sugar harvest or tobacco harvest uh, to the US itself. Not just about that. And by the way, there is a lobby in the US which is trying to counter that and calling for an end to the blockade. Um, but it's also the consequences of um, inflation, which is happening worldwide, uh, and also the impact of COVID. And I mentioned and stressed COVID. Uh, they've had an incredible program of test, track and trace, unlike here in Britain. And the fatalities that they faced are a, a less than a third, perhaps even, I can't remember the figure now, but very, very small in comparison uh, to Britain. Cuba has 11 million people. So if you multiply uh, their statistics by six, you'll get some idea of what the actual, um, you know, consequences of COVID were. But COVID, of course, has had a big impact on travel, and that has meant that there's been a big loss of, of income, particularly of income that can be used um, for purchasing goods on international markets. So something like 11%, 11%, 11 12% of the GDP is as a result of tourism. So that's unfortunately, uh, you know, had a knock-on effect uh, on, on the Cuban economy. Um, so if you are looking for somewhere to go for your holiday, do go to Cuba. I'm going in a week's time. So um, with a delegation of teachers from the, my union uh, of 20 odd teachers going, so we'll make a small contribution. But that's a, that is a big challenge that they face. Um, and in addition to the blockade that I talked about, as I said, it doesn't just affect relationships, trade relationships between the US and Cuba, it affects trade relationships between Cuba and any other country in the world because part of the US legislation that controls or establishes the framework of the blockade um, uh, uh, gives the right of the US to impose fines on companies in other countries who trade with Cuba. So bodies like the HSBC Bank have been fined literally millions of dollars for actually processing Cuban money. Here in Britain, we have very great difficulty in sending solidarity money. When people donated towards the collection for uh, COVID support to Cuba, uh, we've had to go through all sorts of circuitous routes in order to get that money to Cuba. And although the, the UK government uh, votes against the blockade every year at the United Nations General Assembly, it doesn't do anything in practice to, uh, to, to break that blockade or give support to companies 
who want to trade with Cuba. So it, it is a, a real challenge. Um, the, there are still economic relations with Russia, uh, with some of the countries which it formerly was uh, in trade with, but its biggest trading partners are largely Venezuela and Canada. Um, some trade with China, uh, significant trade, uh, and with some other countries as well, of course, but those are just, if you like, the largest uh, countries that are involved. So uh, the, as, as people know, the end of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s brought to an end that relationship which existed uh, between Cuba and the Eastern Bloc countries uh, and caused you know, major problems. Uh, they went through a whole period which was designated the special period when they had to cope with uh, serious reductions in uh, food imports and, and uh, the availability of basic goods and so on. Um, the situation that they face now is not like that, but it is certainly kind of a deterioration on what the Cuban ex experience has been over the last decade. So it is a it is a major challenge. They've been developing the economy in various ways. They've diversified. They've brought in a number of um, measures to encourage or support the existence of cooperatives and on a small artisanal level, um, you know, people having their own uh, restaurants or other kinds of small scale production. But the overall economy remains uh, one of a planned economy, one of a socialist economy, which is established and, and, and is, is carrying forward. The other, just very briefly on the economics, uh, they had, some people will know, a dual currency at one stage, which meant that uh, they were uh, people who went in as tourists had an exchange rate and goods were, that they purchased were priced in that uh, way. It was a form of tax on people coming into the country. Uh, they've now unified the currency uh, and that is going through a process of kind of stabilization. So that's a kind of issue that's there. It's not a major one in the sense of destabilization, but it is a factor. Um, as a result of the blockade, um, Cuba has had many difficulties, and Matt will know this much better than I do, but it gets much of its oil or a large proportion of its oil for, for transport from Venezuela. It has some crude oil that it uses for power production in its um, oil refineries, but there again, they had a, uh, they've had the um, uh, lightning strike on Matanzas on one of the major um, oil refining places, which caused trouble. They've had the hurricane in the west of the island, which has caused devastation across many, many, many acres of um, uh, tobacco plantations and so on. So it, Cuba faces a, a challenge. I don't want to minimize that. It's a serious challenge. And that's why we think, you know, obviously the solidarity movement is very important in breaking out of uh, breaking that isolation of getting the message across that Cuba does not deserve to face this blockade, which is illegal and immoral, uh, and along with the United Nations General Assembly, where 187 countries condemned it, we think Britain should not only condemn it, but should give a positive support to Cuba uh, and Cuba in its development. Thanks, Bernard. Any recommendations on readings? Sorry, I knew there was something else. I was trying not to go on for too long and then I realized <laughs> I was. Um, uh, there are good collections of um, Che's writing that are available. Um, I'll just duck out of view for a second. This is a, a quite, a, it may have changed the cover, but like Matt, this is one of the books I've had for many years. Che and the Cuban Revolution, which includes many of the speeches and so on, which I referenced uh, in the talk, I think is a good as an omnibus collection. His diaries are very interesting. The two diaries on, on his travels in Latin America, um, his uh, diary on Bolivia, his diary in the Congo, I think is really interesting. And the concluding part of that, where he does a very thorough and penetrating analysis of, of the problems that, that the Cubans faced when they went to try to give support to uh, revolutionary forces in the Congo is, is extremely interesting. I think those are some of the, um, the books that I would, I would recommend. And if you go, sorry, I should say as a plug, if you go to the Cuba Solidarity Campaign website, uh, there's a bookshop there and you can go online and have a look and most of those publications should be there.
Brilliant. Thanks so much. And uh, Matt, have you got anything to add to that? Or any, any recommendations for reading as well? Uh, not many. Ben has covered the question and the reading well, I think. The only thing perhaps I would say is um, I would also recommend people read the second Declaration of Havana, which isn't by Che Guevara per se, but I quoted in it and we've talked about it in a previous form. I think that's a really important document of the Cuban Revolution. And if you're just looking on something like Marxist Internet Archives for articles, um, the one I referred to is like the 19, it's called 1966 Message to Try Continental. And that's where he said the famous saying about creating one, two, three many Vietnams. Um, but otherwise, just thank you for everyone for coming. And I thought it was a really fruitful discussion. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone, as Matt says, for joining us this um, evening. And also a massive thank you to both of our speakers. And we hope everyone's enjoyed the discussion. And uh, in the words of Che Guevara, if you tremble with indignation at every injustice, then you are a comrade of mine. Good evening and solidarity, comrades.